forward to the cloud. All right. Go ahead, sir. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this special meeting of the Board of Education. It is Thursday, February 18th, 2021. It is 6 p.m. We are holding this meeting in accordance of the governor's executive order. Ms. Yusko, will you please lead us in the pledge? Absolutely. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Yosko. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Oh, uh, this is our this second is workshop of three, and we have some good presentations tonight. And then hopefully by the end of next workshop next week, we'll have a consensus on a number that Mr. Emmerich can present to us at the following board meeting, and then we'll pass that budget on to the town council. So I will turn this meeting over to Mr. Emmett. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kerry. Good evening, everyone, uh, on this snowy evening. Uh, and I can say at this point in time, no decision has been made about the status for tomorrow, just to let all parents in the group know, not yet. Um, we have a presentation we'd like to provide you tonight that uh, provides some uh, additional rationale for uh, the budget requests uh, that we have in the proposed 2021-2022 budget. So. Um, again, it's, it's a sizable presentation, uh, but it's one we'd like you to uh, just take a look at uh, to be able to digest. So Sally, if you could share your screen. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So we're focused this evening on student success and how our proposed budget reflects the WPS priorities. start off with our stakeholder core values. Again, this is the work that the board has done and put into place. Our focus is being inclusive, a commitment to lifelong learning. We utilize knowledge and skills beyond the walls of the school in spite of there being a pandemic. And we really seek to personalize learning. And we encompass this with focusing on our students, looking for our students to be curious, emotionally intelligent, independent, our educators to be innovative, tenacious, and catalysts, our family partners to be connected, collaborative, and constructive, and our BOE and community partners to be engaged, mentoring, and resourceful. So uh, tonight's presentation is really gonna focus primarily on student achievement. Um, we spend our last bu uh, budget meeting really talking about the, the numbers and those really small numbers and spreadsheets that uh, Matt put together with for us. Mm -hmm. um, but today we really wanna talk about uh, what's most important front of center to all the decisions we make, which are students. Um, and the largest goal within our strategic plan is our student achievement. So today's presentation is gonna weave through some different topics that are priorities uh, given where we are um, through this pandemic, where we're looking ahead for next year, um, and how the, the work we're doing and the priorities um, really highlight the student achievement goal. Um, just as a reminder, uh, our second goal is around civic and family engagement. Um, that is also um, just as important, uh, but as we're coming through the, the current state that we never predicted, um, that student achievement goal is really, I think, on the front and center of all of our minds um, and our community members, and we want to make sure that we're thoughtful in that process and share some of our thinking with you today. And our third goal, uh, which is really the purpose of one of today's meetings, is about management operations and finances, and to continually evaluate those ongoing expenses uh, relative to their ability to promote student achievement. And that's really what tonight's um, presentation will be about, around highlighting a few of those topics. Mr. Emmett? Ah. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things that I mentioned at uh, last week's um, a budget workshop was uh, Weathersfield's participation in CREC's teacher and residence program. Um, it, it is clear that this district needs to make a commitment to teacher diversity and uh, making sure that we are broadening our um, teachers of color. And uh, I am certainly proposing that we participate in this CREC um, partnership. Um, it is a financial commitment, and it is a commitment uh, that I think is going to pay huge dividends for the Weathersfield Public Schools. 
again, this is a push that's at the state level um, and it's at local district level as well. Um, the cost to this to bring in one teacher in residence um, is approximately $65,000. As you saw in last week's uh, budget workshop, we had put in uh, a request for $70,000 for an extended um, summer school program coming out of the pandemic. Uh, my suggestion here would be that we utilize the ESSER funds for the summer school program and we apply the uh, $65,000 toward the teacher in residence program. Um, there are multiple districts in the greater Hartford area that are already participating in this uh, particular program and uh, the interest is growing exponentially. So again, we think this is a strong investment in our uh, teaching future and what is best for our kids. Again, I want to just reiterate uh, the WPS current district priorities and what we're focused on in this pandemic and as we start to move forward out of it, we hope. Uh, that is supporting the health and safety of our students, staff, and the community, continuing to build strong relationships with students and families, getting to know each learner and focus on formative assessment. And the focus on assessment is going to become more prevalent as we see more kids come back into in-person learning. And then obviously, number four, providing equitable learning opportunities for all students. I think you can say very clearly that this pandemic has laid bare some of the inequities in the educational system across this country. Yeah, so I want to build upon that last um, sentence about continuing with a focus on equity and addressing the needs of the whole child. Uh, Weatherspill has always been a district that very much valued the whole child, um, not only academics, but the arts, extracurricular, um, athletics, uh, and I can go down the list. So I really want to talk uh, for a few minutes about our current challenge and um, the learning interruption. So we uh, are, you know, and I think Weathersfield, the state, uh, the nation is really grappling with where we're at and where will, where will we go? What's, what does research tell us and what is the best strategies? So one of the things I want to talk about today is that, um, you know, I don't consider it a learning loss. I think this is a, a way to leverage um, different learning and uh, maybe the silver lining that our students, um, our staff, our parents, um, while it's been incredibly difficult, um, we've all had different uh, ways of learning and learning ways that really weren't typical. So I think we've had a little bit of an interrupted learning um, where it might look different, but um, I wanna highlight the idea of how do we really define learning and how do we measure if students are learning? And we really wanna use that um, analogy of a photo album. Um, and you've heard me talk about this before, and I think this is very true. So while our um, standardized assessment, you know, district assessments show a, a decrease in some of our students that are uh, performing at that um, benchmark area, um, our national research of a lot of our different testing software pro companies also show diff the same trends, um, particularly more of a drop in math than in language arts and reading. Um, but we also want to be careful that we don't um, tip the pendulum back to focusing just on literacy and math or those tested areas. If we think back to about 10 years ago when our federal government had no child left behind and that 100% of our students would be on grade level in those areas and schools across our nation stopped teaching the arts, stopped teaching uh, music, stop teaching the areas that really engaged and were passionate for our students are passionate about and focused just on those uh, core tested areas, we found it didn't work. So I just want us to be aware of the definition uh, as we're talking about student learning uh, now and moving forward, that we've had a change in learning, but what our assessments are measuring are really a narrow slice of that pie. If I take a piece of one slice of the pie uh, for dinner, um, that's really what our assessments are measuring around math and literacy. But we also wanna be able to think about social emotional intelligence. Digital literacy, our students and staff are excelling in digital leader, uh, literacy beyond anything we could have imagined. Um, you know, physical health, mental health. I know in my own family, uh, my teenagers spend a lot more time on their physical health. They have the time. It's something for them to be engaged in and they're excited about that. Um, the arts, athletics, um, relationship building and the art of being able to do that through Zoom and meetings in different ways in today's society. Um, I also wanna recognize that learning at home happens, uh, board games, conversations, um, different activities at home. Um, and also we see you know, passion projects and students having more time to explore things that are passionate to them um, through also clubs and extracurricular. 
So, you know, I think we have a lot to be thankful for because I think uh, in Weathersfield, we do value the whole child and are working hard to continue to provide as many of those engaging and learning opportunities for our students. So with that said, what, what does it look like? Um, you know, our elementary schools are phasing back in and what does it look like? And really, um, the more I do reading, the more we have conversations, really it's going back to the work we did uh, before the pandemic. Um, and actually I was looking at one of our presentations from two years ago and those core research-based strategies are still relevant to today. So how are we gonna help our students as they return back into the classroom? Um, and while they're online or possibly in the remote model, we're gonna continue to work on our fidelity of our workshop instruction and most importantly, our small group instruction. Our students have uh, always had varied learning experiences and varied background knowledge. Um, and that continues now um, during this time. So really targeting that instruction, as Mr. Emmett said, using formative assessment, uh, more and more software companies um, are coming out with excellent um, assessment tools to help teachers. Um, Bobby, I remember you and I talking maybe five years ago, but we wish they would have more of this. And, you know, we're at that time where uh, technology can help us, but it never replaces the power of a teacher in a classroom. So we have really seen and leveraged technology assessments and tools to engage learning, but also to supplement the, the art of teaching by our teachers. Continue with a focus on differentiation. Um, and really a focus on growth for our students. It's not about defining them by their grade or their standards, but to move them along the continuum, just like we wouldn't define ourselves based upon our age or our scale, um, but really more about you know, what we've grown and that growth mindset and how we can grow and monitor our growth and articulate our growth. Um, culturally responsive pedagogy continues to be a priority um, within the district to meet the needs of our diverse students. Um, our data, uh, in Weathersfield across the state and the nation shows that our students of color are less likely to be engaged and have high academic success um, than our white students. So culturally responsive pedagogy and improving the achievement of our high need students. Um, so today in our presentation, I'll hear about the two administrators, both through special education and curriculum. Um, we'll all be working to support all of these areas um, to help improve student achievement. And um, one of the other themes is equity. You know, um, equity is that some students really need more supports um, and it's not all the same. And so how do we improve tier one instruction for all students? And um, we're all providing some students with some additional supports. And so this is not new. This is the work we have engaged with uh, for several years and will continue. Research will tells us that these are still high leverage uh, practices. So it's not that we're doing something different, but going back to the fidelity in supporting these. What will be new is we'll start to embark on a multi-year commitment for universal design for learning, um, which is a, um, a process to help ensure that all students are um, accessing uh, learning and displaying their growth in, in different ways. Um, and so that is something that we will eventually be um, sharing and getting some teachers trained in, but really how are we working with our students? It's not drastically different. So I think what is uh, slightly different, it's not new, social emotional learning uh, priority has always been one of our priorities, but the, the importance and the urgency of social emotional learning is so very different for, for all of us. This is an incredibly stressful time and uh, we've heard it through our student focus groups. We've heard it from staff, from parents. Um, social emotional learning has to be a huge priority as we move forward. Um, and you know, we're not going back to normal. Uh, we're going back to, a, you know, returning to buildings uh, and to education will be forever ch changed as our students, as all of us, all of us have been um, impacted by this pandemic. Coupled with a strong, explicit social emotional curriculum. Um, is a school-wide approach on restorative practices um, and trauma-sensitive practices. Um, restorative practices will be training that we had talked about embarking on this year, um, and then the pandemic hit and, and slowed us down and uh, changed our focus. So it's really important that we dedicate more time and meet more resources supporting social-emotional learning. So if you're bear with me, um, and I wanna show you a four-minute video that really does a great job describing the why and the what, and I think it's worth your time. Um, it is, you know, 
kind of a cartoon style, but it really does an uh, amazing job. And I think that while people say this is important, we want to make sure that we dedicate our time and our resources to supporting this. So I'm going to turn this on and if all works well, it'll play. For children, learning is a social and interactive process that takes place with teachers, other students, and parents. Our emotions and relationships affect how and what we learn. Students are far better prepared to succeed in school and in life if they have learned social and emotional competencies in addition to academic skills. We know that when kids have strong social and emotional learning skills, that they are better able to achieve academically, better able to work with others on a team, to collaborate, to manage conflict, to manage stress, to achieve goals. They have better life outcomes. So it's critically important that we take this seriously if we want to educate the whole child. Social emotional learning is basically the focus on social emotional skills, how to interact with others, how to understand yourself, how to be able to behave in a way that you're supposed to in the right settings. When we think about self-awareness, we're thinking about how do I know and understand myself, my emotions, my thoughts, my cultural identity, what are the ways in which I feel about a certain situation, why might I feel that way, how do I understand myself and how I fit into my family and my community and the broader world. We want to give kids opportunities to really think about their own experiences, their own emotions, um, and how they are dealing with those things. Self-awareness is really being in touch with oneself. I think as a parent, the best thing you can do is to be honest about how you're feeling because kids look at, look at us as we're invincible. You know, we're perfect and we're not. And so I think having honest conversations about your struggles, whether it's at work or, you know, a goal that you're trying to achieve and the challenges that you're having in achieving those goals, kind of brings your situation down to their level so they know they're not alone and that it's normal to kind of feel these different things. One of the things that we work on when we talk about self-awareness is helping students understand emotions. So teaching the vocabulary for emotions, teaching students to think about what different emotions feel like and being able to name that for themselves is an important part. As teachers and adults, we need to go to the next level. And that goes all the way to junior high and high school. There's things called emotion wheels, where you have all sorts of words that even as adults we can look at and say, oh yeah, that's a great word for that emotion. So really being able to help them identify their emotions is huge and give them vocabulary that's challenging them. Secondly then, what do they do with those emotions? What gets you nervous? Or when do you feel stressed out? Or when do you feel angry? Well, I feel angry when Johnny takes my truck. What do you do about it then? But in high school, the same type of thing applies. If I see my friend Stephanie talking to Lisa or sitting with her at lunch, what do I feel? I feel jealous inside. And then asking myself, is that really a big problem? Is that a small problem? And in a classroom, we can model that for kids. So as a teacher, I can say, I'm really feeling disappointed today, fill in the blank. And maybe I'll even take some deep breaths or gosh, everyone's really loud today. We couldn't go outside for recess. I'm feeling frustrated. I need to take some deep breaths. So modeling that for kids is really important. Also teaching kids this idea that through hard work, that they're able to be more successful teaching a growth mindset as opposed to focusing on you're smart but rather focusing more on effort helps kids to understand better who they are. Self-awareness is, is something that is constantly growing and we want to be able to give kids tools and messaging around how to be thinking about their emotions and their understanding of who they are. Um, I want to just bring this back to, well, what does social emotional learning have to do with uh, our budget that we're here to discuss? And really um, the, you know, total sum of this complex ecosystem called Littlefield Public Schools of all our employees, our resources, our time, our goals, and our priorities really um, all tie together for our vision of the graduate. So uh, Weathersfield High School um, has been working with the middle school on a vision of graduate that they're um, working to finish up 
and you know our students uh, have the skills um, um, the content skills, but also the social emotional learning skills are essential for graduation. For them to be a, a communicator, for them to be a, a display citizenship and those civic responsibilities, a collaborator and problem solving, social emotional learning is critical for success. Uh, as John Kazar famously said in one of our meetings recently, you know, I've never known anybody for, to get uh, fired based upon their you know, reading goal or their math goal or their science goal or their grade. Um, it's a, based upon their social emotional learning and their interactions with um, peers and the skills that they have. So John, would you mind talking uh, briefly about the CASEL framework? Is John on there? Yep, I'm on. Let me get uh, unmuted. And uh, uh, so first of all, Sally, uh, thank you. You stole my uh, shtick, but I'll still fit it in there. I should have heard what you're going to say. Um, and so first of all, a good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of the board. Um, I, I do want to thank you for your considerations for uh, some of our new positions, as well as the rest of the budget, um, because I really, I realize uh, how much time you put in uh, for this, including uh, 630 at a uh, Thursday night. Um, and so maybe I'll start off on all, uh, um, you know, Sally shared a little, so maybe I'll go a little more into that story. And uh, I really tell her that I, I do have a wide range of friends and probably like many of you, uh, some of them that are very successful, um, both personally and professionally, and some that I might not consider successful, um, either or uh, personally or professionally, but you know, my friends are my friends. And, uh, you know, although math, reading, science, social studies are very important, I could state that really all of them, their success or lack of success are not due to these subjects. For most of them, I would say their success or lack of success are the results of one of these standards in the second earner circle here. And I'm gonna go over them a little because uh, first, uh, self-awareness, really the ability to understand your own emotions, thoughts, and values and how they influence behavior you know, across contexts. Second, self-management, the ability to manage your emotions, thoughts, and behaviors effectively. And I will say this, I have had some friends um, that have lost their job frequently due to this deficit. And you know, when I ask them, hey, what happened to that job? It's, you know, ah, well, my boss or you know, this person or that person, but really it's their own ability to manage themselves. Next, responsible decision-making, the ability to make caring and constructive choices about your own personal behavior and your social interactions. Relationship skills, uh, the ability to establish and maintain healthy and supportive relationships. Um, so I, I'm proud to say that I've had the same partner, um, hard to believe, but since 1976, and please no one do the math, um, but I do have some friends and I hate to say it, but they've been on their third and fourth marriage. And last, social awareness, the ability to understand, understand sort of the perspectives of and empathize with others, including those from diverse backgrounds, cultures, and contexts. How do we treat others? And, you know, as I said, I don't think I you know, have any friends that have lost a job due to math or science, social studies or science. Um, but really because of their SEL skills. And it really is so important that we make sure that our students, um, you know, our children learn and practice these skills. You know, we always, um, and I'll go with reading, you know, uh, we go through the whole steps, you know, cat, okay, C-A-T, cat. And if they don't learn it, what do we do? We reteach it. We have to do the same with social emotional learning. If a child doesn't get it, we have to reteach it. If they go up in second tier, um, we have to then find a way to reteach it in different manners with different people and more frequently. And so just the importance of uh, social emotional learning. Thank you, John. Um, so based upon uh, community feedback and again, research and where we are as we are going through this pandemic, uh, extending learning opportunities during summer uh, will, is also a priority um, within our budget and expanding general education opportunities. Um, ESY for our students that um, you know, qualify will continue, but we wanna be able to provide some additional uh, general ed opportunities um, like we did last year, but expand from those and uh, change them based upon where we are this year and what we've learned. 
Uh, so we are looking to provide uh, in-person credit recovery opportunities at Weathersfield High School um, for students that had failed classes or need to gain some uh, credit back. Um, so provide that opportunity this summer. And then also providing um, incoming grades K through eight, um, incoming kindergarten readiness courses, um, engaging opportunities in literacy and STEM, um, really with a focus on reducing that learning loss from summer learning loss. Um, research tells us that not just this summer, but any summer, if we're not engaged in uh, learning ongoing, uh, you know, there is a potential for learning loss. Um, to boost our skills, to keep them fresh and boost student skills, um, integrate social emotional learning competencies, collaboration, um, building fr friendships, how do you, you know, the skills that John was just talking about. Um, and provide an opportunity to uh, priority invite for students that need additional support that uh, may be in our SRBI process or have identified that need some additional support. So as we're looking at uh, providing summer learning opportunities, there's a few things that we're also considering. How do we partner with community organizations to extend learning opportunities? How do we uh, I reach out to Park and Rec, uh, the Keene Foundation, but to continue to partner with organizations that also will be offering summer learning programs and to share and uh, to network those opportunities because regardless of where our students are learning with or who or from, um, summer learning is important, uh, whether it's with the public schools, with families ongoing, um, their own passion projects or within community organizations. Um, one of the barriers we're trying to work through is how many staff will be willing to teach summer courses. Um, you know, both staff and students, um, some talk about burnout or just it's really been a long haul on screen. Um, so we are looking for some creative ways to engage teachers and staff um, with some flexibilities and ways uh, to provide as, find as many staff as possible to teach summer courses. Um, and then also we're talking about remote learning flexibilities for staff and student versus in-person learning and contact tracing. There are some districts that are doing all remote learning because of the contact tracing um, and some per people in person. So how do we find that um, balance? So summer school is a priority within our budget to again, extend learning uh, throughout the summer. So one of the administrative positions in the budget is for a seven through 12 um, instructional supervisor for curriculum. Um, so this is related to goal one, action one, about continuously restructuring um, instruction, provide students with a continuum of increasingly challenging opportunities. Um, so uh, I was joking with John and Liz today that um, goal one has the largest uh, number of goals, but I think I have the smallest department of one person. Um, and curriculum and achievement is really, um, well, it's a responsibility of all of our staff, our teachers, our administrators, um, having an additional administrator to help support, especially the secondary level. So um, next week at the Board of Education, you'll have a presentation from uh, the high school regarding MEASC. So I'm uh, kind of previewing that a little bit, um, but they, MEASC has a five-year curriculum calendar review cycle. Um, we uh, have not met that uh, review cycle in, um, you know, through, for, through different reasons, but um, an additional administrator would support those NEOSC recommendations of revising curriculum, focusing on professional development um, strategies as in our strategic plan, and also ensuring we're using those research-based strategies, that again, are also district priorities. Um, so a couple more points related to this position. Uh, several years ago, we had an instructional supervisor for literacy and one for math that uh, was then turned into STEM. Um, those positions were lost through the budget. So this would actually replace one of the two lost instructional supervisor positions. Again, with a focus on achievement, um, which is incredibly, always been incredibly important, but even more so as we come through this pandemic. Currently the middle school and high school do not have any uh, um, coaching positions like the elementary schools do. Um, there used to be a position at the middle school, but to uh, decrease class size, uh, that, that person now um, teaches classes. So this instructional leader would have a strong background in curriculum um, and really focus on innovative teaching and learning practices to improve student achievement. Uh, their prime, prime uh, goal would be to coach and mentor teacher leaders uh, with a uh, you know, effect of improving achievement for our students. Um, they would be uh, working closely with building administration, myself, technology department, um, and would have a lot of background in our state assessments, our standards, and research-based practices. 
So I'm not going to read all these bullets for you, but um, some of you might say, well, wh what would that person do? Um, and that person, you know, um, many of our um, more affluent districts have a, a instructional person in every content area, one for physical education and health, one for math, one for science. In many cases, math has a, you know, an elementary person and a secondary person. There are very few districts that have um, a, the number of ministers we have here in Mothersfield, and I think we do amazing things with a very small um, number, but we ultimately want to be able to support our students and our staff um, and have people with different expertise to be, come to the table to help um, in that collaborative process. So um, definitely a focus on improving curriculum and instruction, and again, I'll let you read through those bullets um, and assist in curriculum writing. Um, there's a large portion of the responsibilities around assessment and data and analyzing assessments, uh, working with teachers to look at formative assessments. Um, how do we help with, um, how do we help support teachers to look at their math assessments and look at some of the different uh, ways to group students to best meet their needs? Um, and also look to implement their strategic plan, um, both through the district view, the school plan and individual teacher um, learning profiles. Um, they would also be doing in-service for staff, uh, parents, and administrators. Um, and other responsibilities related to uh, staff evaluations, uh, feedback, budget, you know, um, and other things related to curriculum. So that's a little bit about uh, the position and some of the responsibilities. So, so why? Why is it important to have an additional curriculum administrator? Um, so really we wanna make sure that all students have access to a high quality um, curriculum and have an entry point. One of the things we've looked at recently is our attendance data um, for roughly the months of November and December. And we find a higher rate of attendance with our students of special education, 504 students and students that are free and reduced. Um, and some of our uh, uh, different race and ethnic groups also have some higher attendance rates. So really this tells us a trend because if they're not in school, uh, they're not engaged and they're not learning and succeeding at high levels. And we wanna make sure that we provide opportunities to be able to reach all our students. So an instructional supervisor really would be working closely with teachers to help differentiate, to help meet the varied needs within their classrooms to ensure that our special education students, our 504 students, um, our free and reduced students and any students that aren't engaged in the learning process that we find an entry point and ways to support them through instruction um, and assessment and to engage them into that learning process so that we have greater success for all our students. The next few slides um, highlight some of the data from our um, SBAC and I'm not gonna you know, go through each one. Um, I'm sure we'll share this slide with you later, but you know we've seen overall um, at the secondary level um, fairly, um, you know, I think that we, our students achieve fairly well, but we haven't continued to see that growth over time. And so we're not seeing a continued growth in our scores um, over the years. And so when we look at our data, um, also at our high needs group and our not high needs group, we find that our students that are not high needs, so they are general education students, they're not special ed, English language learners, 504 students, or students that receive free and reduced meals, um, they perform at a pretty high level. But our students that are in the high needs group, there's a large gap um, in through that performance. And so um, our work around curriculum instruction and working with teachers um, and research-based strategies will help to engage those students that need some additional support. Um, so that's some, uh, you know, we see some similar trends in math data at the middle school. And we also see some similar uh, trends in our um, SAT data at the high school. Um, one of the things that many board members ask for when we do our presentation is also our DERG ranking. Um, out of the 24 towns, where do we rank? Um, so for our um, SBAC, this, this particular data set looks at grades three through eight. Um, we're, you know, a little below middle in our student achievement data. Um, and at the uh, high school level with our SATs, again, we'd like to see it even greater. While we have some high standards and high, high scores, we'd like to see some increases in those scores. And um, also some increases in our 
um, standings in within our DERG for our SATs. So those are some of the reasons uh, why we are bringing forward and supporting uh, the addition of a um, 7 through 12 instructional supervisor to support uh, students, particularly our high need students, um, to be able to access a high quality education at both middle school and Wethersfield High School. John? Yeah, so um, I'll um, follow up with Sally that, uh, you know, the special services department's vision um, is every child every day. And I hope people are sick of me saying it because if they're sick of me saying it, they know it. And our number one goal is to develop high quality inclusive practices. And uh, this is aligned with many of the goals, including goal one, uh, because, uh, you know, I do have to point out and so important to remember that students in special ed are first and foremost general education students. But I also want to point out goal one in action five, incorporate educational equity practices into policies, procedures, and classroom practices to ensure that all students receive what they need to succeed. The additional supervisor will bring us closer to the goal of developing high quality inclusive practices and then decrease the achievement gap. Um, I will state that I cringe when I see the data that Sally shared and when I see that data because it really does point out the achievement gap and how big it is. And so with this, if you wanna to go to the next slide, Sally. Okay, and so uh, some of the rationale be behind uh, uh, the uh, proposal is, um, first of all, to look at, um, because we really have in the past four years, um, identified, developed, and expanded specialized programs in the district. And Liz will talk about this in more depth in a minute. And I really, I have to, uh, I don't know how to do enough shout outs to uh, Liz. I mean, she is such an amazing um, addition to the district and the work just alone and the specialized programs has been amazing. Um, second, an increase in both the count and prevalence of students with disabilities in the district. And I have a little graph of that I'll share in a second. Um, but then just the changes in special ed mandates and procedures, um, which really has led to an increase of mediations, intensified legal ramifications, and an increase of high profile cases uh, requiring really additional supervision. And, and I will say this, and. Uh, Mr. Emmett, I think you'll agree with me uh, that the job has changed so much in the last 10 years since Mr. Emmett sat in this seat, um, even, even in the past four years since I first started. Indeed. Uh, we've had, yeah, <laughs> but we've had the addition of dyslexia classification, uh, more liberal independent education evaluation guidelines, um, changes of mandatory services to the age of 22. I, I loved it. We learned of that. I think it was on graduation day I learned of that that was for that year. And two years, if people don't realize this, we'll even have a brand new platform and outline of our um, IEPs. So our actual, our IEP is gonna change in two years. And then also uh, uh, just the collaboration uh, with school teams to uh, provide high quality inclusive practices. Um, and, Liz, I don't know if you want to share. I, I know you're telling me a little bit, uh, even today, um, sharing some stories. Can you uh, share a little, Bob? Uh, sure, absolutely. And John and I were, you know, as we often do with our offices just across the hall from one another, talk about our daily practice um, and just the amazing work of our teachers, right? Um, especially in the special services department. Um, and we talked about the challenges um, of the position as John had just mentioned, um, but also the importance and assurance that our teachers are provided with the coaching and support that they needed. Um, I had just such, such a wonderful interaction with one of our teachers this morning and a really deep conversation around actually deepening comprehension um, and the strategies that she would apply to um, her, her practice um, and really honing in on her explicit instruction. Um, and it's these really valuable conversations that um, really improve our outcomes of our students. Um, and, and to dilute that um, with some of the things that John had just mentioned uh, um, would, would 
we would see that in our students' progress and we would see that in our students' outcomes. So just assuring that, that our teachers have that support and that they're provided with the resources um, that they need to serve our student population. And so thank you, Liz. And last, uh, uh, to decrease the achievement gap. I know I talked about that, but I hate that our numbers are here compared to general ed and we got to get that closer. Um, and so with this, I'll just uh, have a slide on, next slide for, uh, both our count and prevalence of students uh, has increased. Um, I sent some of this information to the board, but you can see the increase from 13.3% uh, uh, to, um, Jeff, thank you the other day. It's now at 15.44% and just our count has gone up also. Um, and then next slide. Oh, I'll have Liz talk about the uh, specialized programs. Yeah. Sure. And just reflective of that previous data point, you know, though it's those type of numbers that tell us where we need to really focus our um, support. Um, and, and one of the areas that Weathersfield chose to um, focus on over the past several years um, is the support of our students and our specialized programs in those classrooms, um, pre-K through, um, of course, pre-K um, through post-graduation, um, but more particular to our pre-K through um, eighth grade students and program services here in Weathersfield. Um, I, I was, I was looking at this data and, and reflecting when I when I first started um, just a little over two years ago and our preschool has already had an increase of 50% um, in just over two years. Um, and our you know program in general um, at Webb Elementary, um, our ABA program has increased from a, a one classroom program to a two classroom program. Um, and and it, it just, it brings me such joy to, to know that we are committed as a district um, and as a community to support all of our learners um, and to support those learners that need very unique instruction and um, very unique needs um, and you know are supported through our behavior analytic processes um, that are supported through our trauma-informed practices and, and a really um, very unique um, evidence-based research practices. A and it's through um, this commitment that we're able to provide services to these students um, in a very exceptional way. Um, the dedication of our teachers um, to the improvement of their practices to serve our students um, is just tremendous. Um, the, these groups of teachers, you know, come in every day, especially through the pandemic, um, unwilling to take no for an answer um, and to ensure that our students are provided um, what they need. So it's just been a tremendous, um, tremendous growth for the department over the past several years to see these programs established um, and really take flight. Um, we have expanded our program at the middle school level as well through our human re uh, relations class and classroom and class um, servicing a unique group of students um, around not only behavioral and social emotional support um, but through trauma-informed practices and, and through discussion and through listening to our teachers and our parents and our student needs um, restructuring the middle school special education department um, to focus on different student needs. Um, and, and with that came the development of what I would say is probably um, the most, um, what should I say, reflective of an inclusive, of an inclusive practice setting. Um, but that's um, really the support of our students in our more intensive resource classroom. Um, and, and those students together have a unique group of needs, um, but through the support, we are able to provide um, high quality programming right here at um, Silestein Middle School. So that's just some of the trends that we've seen in our specialized programming. Yeah, and just if you could stay on this slide because um, I know Liz talked about the de dedication. First of all, all the staff in our department are amazing people and the work they do with our children is just outstanding. But I do have to point out um, for this staff and especially the pandemic, I mean, I know it's a scary time um, but I, I love this. When we went to um, the staff members of uh, these programs and we said, hey, we really like to bring you know, these students because they really have the highest needs back four days. Um, the one thing I heard more, more often than others was, what about the fifth day? I mean, 
And honestly, these are our students that some of them have the most difficulty wearing our mask. Some of them, you know, I know if Charles Brown was here, um, you know, he might uh, not think highly of this, but it's impossible to keep six feet distance. I mean, forget about keeping one foot distance. And these staff are in there every day. And I, I do have to say, and uh, Liz, you should get a commission on these uh, programs because, uh, you know, I mean, well, really, <laughs> because I do, I John. The, As the part of this money. community, I do, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the amount of money that saved both, um, you know, bringing back students and um, cost prevention from sending them out. Because well, John, if, John, if, John, if I could interject there, I, I want to make sure that we quantify this piece because this, I think, is what is critically important. And, you know, let's think back. The board charged us with developing some in-house programming and in-house servicing as, as an effort to um, reduce costs for out-of-district placements. And we know every year, I say it, that special education is always the wild card. So I'm looking at this graph and I see a total of 47 students that potentially would have gone out of district for, for out of district programming. Matt, from your perspective, what's, how do we quantify this in terms of savings and cost avoidance? Sure, so in the Friday update to the Board of Ed, we did quantify ABA and Strive. And we looked at the 27 students in ABA, the four in Strive, and obviously we're getting the benefit of these students remaining in district, they're learning as part of the community, they're not being outplaced to another facility or another town. Beyond that, we're looking at a conservative estimate of an annual savings of a million and a half dollars per year. So rather than presenting a 2.7% increase, we would be here talking about a 5% increase. So not only are these students remaining in Weathersfield, but it's a huge, financial benefit to the town. And again, with, with this program, I, I would remind the, the board that originally there was a request for an additional um, special education supervisor to help administer these programs. Um, as we talked last week, you know, Liz and John, and specifically Liz with regard to ABA with her, her strong um, behavioral background, really is an integral part in supporting the work that goes on at Webb Elementary School. Uh, John, with his background in psychology, is critically uh, important to the STRIVE and the SDMS programs. Um, but the reality is we still have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of PPTs that we have to get done. We have students that receive special ed services that attend uh, uh, magnet schools. There's a responsibility there as well as the LEA. Um, so it is obviously a, uh, a process here that uh, we need to undertake to get these programs administered. And again, I think further rationalization and justification for why we need this additional position. So thank you, John, back to you. And I'll, I'll just add to that because really number one thing for an additional position, we need to close the achievement gap. I mean, that's it. And I think, you know, these programs are unbelievable and they really, it's keeping our students with us, but we need to close that achievement gap. Um, and so if we go on to the next slide, um, and. and Bobby, I, don't know, I can't see Bobby, somewhere there. Um, Bobby, I know you asked sort of about duties. And instead of going, I was gonna ask Trent for um, the duties of special ed supervisor, but I thought I would just, um, with some help from uh, uh, Kristen Underhill and Liz, um, we sort of redid my organizational chart just because there's a lot of duties that come through this office that probably people do not even know. And I'm not gonna go through them all, um, you know, but things like uh, the Title IX coordinator and uh, Title Title IV ADA coordinator, McKinney Vento coordinator, um, you know, the idea grants, which oof, I think I got to start working on that, Liz. We got to start working on that. Um, but then uh, state reports, uh, the ED 166, the ECHO was the early childhood. Um, we're just at our door today with uh, where are these six students. And so we had to jump on that. Um, there's just so many duties that this office covers. And I do have to say this office, we have an amazing office staff here too, because without uh, Ro, uh, Pat and Nadine, we could not do it. Um, but sort of we coordinate all of this through this office. So before we go on to our uh, next part of our presentation and John Liz, thank you for that part. Um, I want you just to open it up for conversation uh, and questions, and then we're going to move on to tools for effective instruction a little bit from our um, IT department. 
Any questions? Um, we've done a lot of talking uh, to you, so I want to engage you into some questions you might have. Sally, on that slide before, that's John on the left and Liz on the right? Yes, correct. correct. And we're trying to add a second person to the right? Uh, yes. Okay. And you know, I can't say exactly how we would split it up, but I think especially Liz's background with ABA, I would want her more involved with that. Um, you know, and I, Mike, uh, Mr. Emmett said this, but I think it's sort of the yin and yang, uh, but also getting somebody then who can get in more to the resource support in the buildings to really look at that data around closing the achievement gap. Great question, Chuck. Any other questions, comments? Bobby, I have a question on Strive. Is Strive the program that that Hamner and it was for, we decided they were, they, these were children who had experienced trauma. Am I right? Well, can I, it's based on uh, trauma-based practices, but it really is for students that are having some sort of social, emotional, behavioral difficulties. So, I mean, and I'll say this, Bobby, and you probably know this too, even though we may not know if a child has um, trauma in their life, a lot of times they present with behaviors that look like there could be trauma. And so it really is based on those practices, but you can't say definitely that every child there has, you know, been involved in some sort of traumatic experience. Well, I just wanted to relate it to the times we're going through yeah. that when we have the schools with all the students back in them and you know, they're misbehaving or whatever, they're acting out, we don't know why. They have been to a very traumatic time. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering if that, um, I know it takes a long time to get children into these classes, um, but that should be something that we're aware of. Yeah, and first of all, Bobby, I, and I hate to predict this. I mean, first of all, I can't wait to the day that all our children are back in our schools together, but it's gonna be a difficult time. These are some children that have not had to share play spaces, um, you know, work um, you know, amongst a class, uh, be in the, the um, lunch hall with all the other students making noise. And so uh, absolutely all our students have been through some traumatic experiences with the pandemic. We all have been. And so we, we expect an increase of the uh, behavioral issues. And that's really why the push for, um, you know, the SEL um, on all tiers. And this, the STRIVE program is really that upper tier three um, around social emotional learning. Yeah, I'd also like to interject too, just, you know, with regard to these positions from the director of special services to instructional supervisor for special education, you know, it is also a support to the, um, the building principal. And, you know, I certainly need to give a shout out to, um, to Ken Craig uh, over at Webb, to Patrick Cohn over at Hanmer and to Rosalind Bannon over at, um, uh, at the middle school and actually high school administration as well. You know, we have our, our ALS program and our ADP program at the high school, specialized programs to support kids. You know, these particular positions also support the building principal and allow the building principal the, the freedom to be able to run the building on a day by day basis. Um, obviously, these programs can um, create their own level of complexity and having this support from the central office level to support classroom staff from uh, behavior specialists to uh, paraeducators, uh, to teachers, as well as our principals and our regular ed staff as well. Critically important because remember with these programs, we always want to try and focus on as much inclusive practice as we possibly can. So these positions are really wide ranging in terms of their benefit. Yeah, and Mike, if I could just add, because I think the principals really have added the culture. So these are no longer those children these are our children. These are no longer special ed students. They're web students or Hamner students or Silas Dean students. And that is such an important distinction to make, to make uh, you know, them feel part of the building. And really that's what a high quality inclusive environment is. These are our children. So to piggyback off Bobby, I thought that was a great question, Bobby, talking about the challenges when these students come back. So do you envision having a second special ed supervisor as a, another like tool in the toolbox to help teachers and principals with even the regular ed students that are having a hard time transitioning back from this pandemic as it's another, another tool that we're gonna have readily available to help us? Absolutely, and I'll even um, 
Well, I can't remember if it's our third or fourth goal is. I think it's fourth. Um, even though SRBI really is a general ed mandate, our goal um, in special services is to improve SR, SRBI because we know that it's part of us. And so, yes, we're always involved in all aspects from tier one all the way. And I always say through tier three and into the special ed tier one, tier two, tier three. And so, yeah, it's a resource, um, you know, we're involved in a lot. Chuck, if I may, I have a couple of quick questions. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So first off, great presentation so far. Appreciate the hard work that you guys put into it and the passion with which you do your job. So my two questions, and they're, they're somewhat, especially the first one, general. In terms of the summer learning program, maybe this is for Michael, are you envisioning this as a one-year kind of response to the pandemic and a one-year uh, budget event, or are you anticipating this as an ongoing uh, additional summer offering? Uh, and before you answer that, my second question might, might be easier. You, Sally, you referenced the administrators per our other towns and that we may have fewer. And I think you guys have given us the data before. I'm sure you have. Can you give it to us again in terms of the number of administrators in Wethersfield comparative to other towns? So those are my two questions, the summer learning and the number of administrators. All right, uh, two questions. First and foremost, the uh, question number two with regard to comparison of administrators, I went into EdSite today. That will be in the Friday update tomorrow. So I've taken all of DIRG-D and I've broken it down by school level and district level administrators. And I've also included a column for enrollment so that you can compare uh, districts because some districts, you know, for example, East Granby is 836 students at the low end. And on the upper end, you've got Southington with 6,336. So Kenny, I'm working on that, all of that information. I just pulled that up today. Uh, with you. regard to the, to the summer school programming, you know, right now, uh, as of today, we just got the needs assessment from the state for the ESSER money. Uh, you know, the ESSER money does have some flexibility in terms of how long we can take to spend it. I would certainly look at this being longer range as opposed to a one and done. Clearly from our perspective, the extended school year program for our students with special needs, that is etched. That is something we are legally mandated to provide. That won't change. Um, what we'll obviously look to do is we'll look at our mitigating factors that you know, we may find, like Sally mentioned, are we going to have the requisite number of staff members we need to run these programs? How are we gonna blend uh, in-person versus um, virtual? Um, that's going to be another factor. And then again, we're looking for participation. Now, what our data tells us from last summer, Sally um, developed the class program, which was the um, regular ed summer enrichment program. The numbers were, were quite impressive. We actually had to go out and bring in additional teachers to support that. So seeing that, you know, what the numbers look like after the first year, if this is something that's successful, um, again, for our high school uh, students, if we're finding the credit recovery is successful and we can do it in-house, we'll certainly look to do that. Past, we um, tried to run it and we don't get a huge number. Um, so we'll look and see. Again, if it is well subscribed, I certainly look to continue it on uh, for the future. Got it, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Chuck, I have a question as well, please. Yes, John, no, sorry, I had to get to mute. That's all right. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Very informative and uh, great um, segue into a lot of questions for the future. Uh, my question is, have you ever looked at, this is to John and Liz, the uh, opportunity to put a, a special ed instructor on each team at the middle school? Has that come across in any of the conversations with the faculty members or the teachers within the building and the administration? Because um, you know, with, with regards to the pandemic and the kids coming back to school, but the needs of our students uh, with our enrollment figures and uh, cases that we have for children needing additional support, has that conversation come to the table? So yes. Uh we have talked about that. I mean, because and I'll, I'll say the, it would make things a lot easier than trying to cross teams and work with two teams. Um, but right now, uh, you know, honestly, it's more of a budgetary and uh, especially two years ago and last year, um, we really did a uh, look at special ed caseloads 
um, you know, needs, everything else. And um, actually, I think I presented to the board, I can't remember, um, but really looking at the highest need at that point with the high school was the highest need. And that's why we did a move last year over to uh, one of the high school positions. And second on the needs was High Crest, um, just with their high number of, um, you know, higher number of students within High Crest and higher number of uh, special ed students. And so, uh, you know, those looked at like our number one and number two priorities um, for staffing. One thing that makes it tough at the elementary level, you know, looking at two teachers to cover six great, well, sorry, seven grades with uh, kindergarten is very difficult to split up. Um, you know, most districts, they have the K to five and the middle school six to eight. So um, we have considered it, but really with the priorities of needs in districts, we couldn't do it, John. Right. right, John, what I'm trying to get at is what we've discussed is nothing new. For years, a lot of these proposals have been in our budgets and they've just kind of fallen back because of uh, commit, uh, you know, reductions in the force and trying to be fiscally responsible. But at the need of what we are going to go down the road in the future, this is gonna be a problem. And uh, if you look back at the list of reductions in our budget over the last five years, a lot of these positions were in our proposed budgets, but they had to be removed. So um, I, you know, I applaud you for moving forward to get a toolbox and what you can put in it and make it happen and being creative with your staff. But there's going to come a time where we're going to have to, you know, get in there and, you know, look at it in a different direction, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. What, I don't know how to get in here. Elaine, you have a question? Yeah, but I don't know how to get in there. But anyway, I wanna know the cost of this. You know me, Chuck, I don't know how to run this thing, but I wanna know, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. It's in the budget okay. document, Matt. I'm mapping, I don't have it up. Matt, do you have it up? Yeah, Julie, I think we're at, we're at step three of the, WASA contract for next year, about 126K for each okay. position. I said 130 in my mind, but thank you. No problem. Good question. And I apologize, board members. I only see four people at a time. I don't so, even see anybody. <laughs> yeah, and I see the presentation. Mr. Yeah, Michaels, I think you had a question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just two quick questions. One for Sally on the curriculum side of it. Is there sort of a, could you just briefly tell us, um, a difference between a curriculum supervisor, specialist, coordinator, and that sort of tier, and if that's something that we also should be looking at. And then my other question is for Michael, and if you had any more information on the scope slash use of um, the teacher and residents and where you're looking to put them. Yeah, Lou, that's a great question. Um, every district has a little bit of a different naming system um, within our um, administrator contract. Um, you know, we've typically had um, a director of curriculum. Um, before I was assistant superintendent, I was a director of curriculum. And then underneath that would be an instructional supervisor, um, like John is a director and an instructional supervisor. Some districts are coordinators, some, you know, they have a lot of different names, um, but that would be essentially a, a curriculum person that would serve underneath my my role as assistant superintendent, regardless of what you want to call it. But in our district, we call them instructional supervisors. And then Lou, to your, your uh, question regarding the teacher residency program, right now at this point in time, CREC and is with along with the state is focusing on an elementary certificate. So we would be limited in terms of having teachers and residents at the elementary level. Um, it is an 18 month commitment. Um, and for the resident, it is intensive coursework along with side-by-side -side with a certified teacher mentor in the district. So we would need to identify teacher mentors in the district. Um, at the bare minimum, they must be team mentor trained. Then they need to make a commitment for additional training. And then this individual would be in the classroom as a teacher in residence um, for the entire school year. Um, so it, it is a large commitment. Um, obviously, you know we're looking at within, for some of our uh, employees, like our tutors or our paraeducators that uh, may not be certified, but have a bachelor's degree and might be interested in taking that next step. 
Um, you know, I have to say the state of Connecticut with their certification process, and those of you who are teachers understand uh, it is a cumbersome process. And uh, this program, which was started by CREC a couple of years ago, um, was really designed to break down some of the barriers to allow um, quality candidates to be able to get certified. So, and again, for us, looking at it from a perspective of being able to um, increase the number of teachers of color as our um, students become more diverse, we certainly think it's a win-win. Thank you. Any other board members? Just speak out. Yes, Ms. Granato. I have a comment. It's interesting. We're talking about CREC and we're talking about um, two supervisor positions. CREC is actually looking for um, supervisors of diversity, equity, and inclusion per school system. That goes along with having a, you know, a student teacher who is in this diversity idea. Um, actually, that's where the whole state is going is this idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, so as we're talking about trying to get new people in, we're kind of already falling behind because they're adding new people. Um, and I said this last year, I'm always so sad that the, the school system is the system that's cut all the time. People are looking for money to cut, they cut the school system. And now we are starting not just to be behind, but we're also starting not to be with the others to begin with. And that's a shame. Thank you. Any other board members? I had a question for um, John. Would that uh, new position uh, for special education uh, report to you? And I also just wanted to make a comment that uh, I'm appreciative of the, uh, the four days um, in school that uh, that certainly benefits uh, my son, so thank you. So um, first of all, yeah, the uh, position would fall under uh, under me. And um, second, thank you. I mean, and I'll say this, and uh, I don't know how our parents are doing it. I mean, it really, it is so hard to, you know, educate a child at home. So I, I do thank you as long, as well as all our other parents, because uh, luckily mine are, well, 25, 26, and 29, so I don't have to worry about their education, but my heart goes out to all the parents out there. Thank you. All right, anyone else? And I figured out how I can see more people. It's amazing, I see most of you now. <laughs> I only see six. Yeah, no, I slid it over, okay. But anyone else before we move on? Excellent, Sally, floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Mr. Carey. I'm actually gonna turn it over to Sarah Harris, Instructional Supervisor for Technology to talk about effective uh, tools for effective instruction. Thank you, Mrs. DeSoli, and good evening, everyone. Um, as we reflect on all of the fantastic things uh, that are already happening in our district that we've heard about this evening um, and look ahead to uh, the goals that we've set forth um, earlier in our discussion, the next part of our conversation will continue to be grounded in the strategic plan. Next slide, please. So specifically, we'll be looking really at goal one, action one. Um, and as we think about how we continue to infuse authentic learning approaches in curriculum and reflect on the NEASC report and our focus on really ensuring that we have robust curriculum um, and strong evidence-based instructional practices, we have to make sure that we have the appropriate tools to support our teachers in that work. Um, and of course, if we look at our tools for teaching now, the tools in a teacher's toolbox today in 2021 look vastly different than they did five years ago. And if we look at our toolbox today in 2021, our tools look phenomenally different than they did uh, in really even in February of 2020. The reality is our work uh, and the way that we deliver instruction in our classrooms has changed drastically over the last year um, to meet the challenges of the pandemic. But as we look ahead, we know that we will continue to use the practices that we have learned throughout this uh, past year. And that the tools, many of the tools that we have started using over the last year will continue to uh, follow our uh, work as we move back into classrooms. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
Oh, there we go. Oh, sorry. Can you go back? There we go. Go back. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Sorry, it took a second to load there. So as we think about the, uh, the software applications that we have in classrooms, um, we how do we decide what software applications we use, right? We know that there are many out there, particularly now. Um, if you are an educator, you know that you are receiving, uh, at one point, I think I was receiving, you know, 15, 20 emails a day from different companies saying, you know, here's a new great software. So how do we decide which tools we want to use in our classrooms? So we look at a number of factors. The first thing we look at is the usage data. So I like to look at that, I like to call that the what, right? The, the what's being used, uh, the quantitative data. And if you could click once for me, Sally. Thank you. Here's an example of that. We have a platform called Screencastify. And Screencastify um, is a tool for instructional delivery. Uh, it allows our teachers to create instructional videos for students. We have teachers using it with our remote learners. We have teachers using it with our in-person learners. Um, and this is, this is an example of the kind of usage statistics that we get. We can see that 7,157 videos were created by our Weathersfield teachers on Screencastify in the year 2020. That's pretty incredible. Um, and if you look at, you know, we had some teachers, a small number of teachers using it in 2019, you can really see how, just how significant that is. So that's an example of the usage data we have. Another really interesting example would be um, Screencastify provides a list of our top users. And so our, our number one user in the district is a, a high school teacher. Our number two user in the district is a first grade teacher. And I find that data absolutely fascinating because it really speaks to the breadth of the tool, right? Screencastify is a tool for effective instruction that is being used effectively at our high school level and is being used with our youngest learners as well. One click, please, Sally. Uh, yeah. Along with the what, uh, we always, we wanna look at the how, right? We know we have lots of tools, but how are they being used? And for that, we really focus on collaboration with teachers. So in my position, I do a lot of talking with teachers. We gathered survey data from teachers in June of 2020 asking, what are you using and how are you using it? And how is it changing your instruction? And our teachers really can provide some of that expert information on what's working for their students in their classrooms, in their content areas. And then finally, the why. Why are we using the tools we're using? We like to use data-driven evidence-based reviews. Uh, an organization called Ed Reports is a good example. Uh, they take all sorts of educational technology. They look at the tools in terms of the content area standards, and they really provide us with an objective lens um, to help us make those decisions as we're working with teachers on what technology is not only going to be uh, best for instructional delivery, but certainly best for students and aligned with our standards. Next slide, please. So as we think about our software, um, you likely noticed that it is a, a significant piece of the uh, instructional technology budget in Weathersfield. And I like to think of the, our software as being really falling into three different categories. The first being in, uh, software for instructional delivery. Next slide, please. So our instructional delivery software would be those tools that we use for delivery of content. Um, those could be recording instructional videos. It could be supporting engagement when we're trying to do live instruction with in-person learners and learners at home. Um, it could be providing those ongoing opportunities for quick check-ins with students and formative assessment to gather data on students. And a couple of examples of those would be Edpuzzle and Screencastify and Pear Deck all of which allow our teachers to deliver instruction and engage learners both in the classroom and at home. And here's an example of one of those tools. So we have something called Pear Deck. Um, and as you can see in the 2021 school year, 2,452 of our 3,600 students have used Pear Deck. That is a very high number. Um, and that does reflect again that this is a tool being used not just at the middle school, not just at the one of the elementary schools, not just at the high school, but across our district.
We also have tools that are specifically related to particular content areas, right? We know that teaching math is different than teaching social studies is different than teaching art and PE, particularly when it comes to teaching students who are learning from their living rooms at the same time we're teaching students who are learning in our physical school buildings. Next slide, please. And so we have a wide variety of applications specifically focused on providing content specific instruction. Some examples of that might be science labs, right? It is very hard in the current environment to provide a true science lab experience for students in our classrooms. So providing virtual science labs, providing digital resources for our physical education classes and some of our fitness work with our secondary students, providing music composition software so that our students who aren't able to play instruments in the classroom or sing aloud are able to transition to a different area of focus that is still aligned with our music standards providing math type that's compatible with Google for Education, right? So that our students can provide answers and show their work on math assignments. Providing a graphing calculator, which is really an equity issue, right? Making sure that every one of our kids can access a graphing calculator in, at the high school on their Chromebooks, whether or not they personally own a you know, TI-84 graphing calculator. And then that last bucket, if you will, of instructional uh, learning software is the classroom management and safety piece. Particularly now when our students are learning from home, ensuring that they are as safe as we possibly can on uh, district devices is incredibly important. So this really comes down to one, one big tool that we're currently using in our second grade through 12th grade classrooms. And this is called GoGuardian. GoGuardian is a tool that supports teachers um, in classroom management and provides um, a resource for teachers to communicate one-on-one -on -one or as an announcement to the whole class. And it also provides a behind the scenes monitoring system that provides me and the principals in each building with alerts about concerning or explicit activity on Chromebooks. It also provides, thank you, Sally, um, some really nice data that gives us an idea of how our devices are being used. So you can see, I took this data today, you can see uh, the top uh, websites that are being visited by our students, and you can see that they really do align with the resources we would expect being used in classrooms. Thank you, Sally. And then the other side, right? So we have we have the, the instructional um, software and applications. And of course, none of that matters or works uh, without a robust hardware and network infrastructure. So we talked last budget workshop about the fact that we have more devices in the hands of students and teachers than we ever have before. And as we look toward the future, while we have uh, pretty good numbers and fairly low um, damage rates, we recognize that ongoing repair will be a reality of the world in which we're living. So making sure that we have the funds um, to provide continued equitable access to all of our students and all of our teachers so they have the devices they need to learn and the devices they need to provide instruction. Our classroom technology, uh, while robust, is, is constantly aging. Uh, as the years go on, our smart boards at the elementary level will need to be replaced. Um, and we also need to continue to uh, update and replace our projectors across the district to ensure that all of our projectors are providing nice bright images for our teachers. Those are just two examples of some of those classroom technology pieces that, that will need to continuously be uh, repaired and replaced. And we need to make a priority to ensure that we continue to provide the teachers with the tools they need. And then uh, last and certainly not least, as this really is, is the center of it all, um, our WPS network. So Mr. DeReagan um, and the IT team work incredibly hard to ensure that we have a robust network. Um, we, we know that we are living in an, in an, in an increasingly comp complex world, um, and particularly when we talk about network safety, um, it is getting more and more complex every day. Um, and so ensuring that we have funds to provide uh, the infrastructure we need to keep our students and our staff safe, um, and also ensuring that we have uh, the software that we need to ensure that all of our devices across the district are safe for the users. And so as we wrap up our conversation today, we wanted to return to something that I've shared with the board before. So this, this is something that I, I feel very strongly about. And I know that in the work that Liz and I are doing with the sites team, which we've talked about before, um, this really sits at the center of it. It's not about the technology, right? The technology is an incredibly powerful vehicle. 
Uh, the technology right now, especially, um, is a vehicle like no other that is allowing us to access and provide equitable access to all of our students. But it's really about the instruction. And so as we look toward the future and everything we've shared with you this evening, the right tools in the right hands with the right support can be incredibly powerful. And so we'll leave you with this quote that it's about the pedagogy, it's not about the technology. And as we uh, wrap up today, we'd like you to continue with that idea in mind. It's about student success and it's about providing teachers and students and administrators and all of the staff in our community uh, with the tools they need to support our students. Thank you. Thank you. Any board members with questions, comments? That was awesome. Yes, awesome job, great job bringing our technology budget to life. I do have a question. Do you see the need for like Go Guardian next year? Is it gonna, like, if we're, if we're back in school, is that still gonna be used? I see Mr. Cohen with his head, shaking his head. So I'll take him at his word, but I yeah. <laughs> they still can see That's him. a great, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and, and I would say absolutely. So first of all, I, you know, I can tell you, I used Go Guardian as a classroom teacher uh, several years ago before it had all the capabilities that it has now. Um, and I found with one-to-one -one technology in my seventh and eighth grade classroom, it to be a, an incredibly powerful classroom management tool. When we look at it now, um, it really has gone beyond that. It's become a communication tool. Um, it's become a tool for us to better understand how our students are using the technology in the classroom and help them better understand how they're using the technology. So it kind of releases the teacher, if you will, from that responsibility of constantly circling, right? Constantly circling to make sure you see what's on every kid's screen. Um, and instead allows us to have that data if we need it, but really be able to, to just teach and just instruct our students. Um, so absolutely, I, I would say that from a safety and security perspective, along with a classroom management perspective, it will continue to be a, a valuable tool for us in classrooms. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, Chuck, absolutely. A comment and a question, Chuck, if it's okay. Go ahead, Mr. Lesser, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sarah, first of all, great presentation and thank you for all the work that you and Jeff and your teams are doing. It's nothing short of amazing. And like I've said before, if this pandemic happened 10 or 15 years ago, I don't know how we would have any remote learning. I wouldn't know what kind of schooling we would have. Oof. So awesome, just, just amazing. My question revolves around the future. And the question is, what's next? Meaning technology changes so rapidly. And just briefly, can you tell us what you're working on uh, in terms of in the next year or two that may be something that our, we don't have now that would be valuable for our teachers and staff, uh, the latest and greatest in technology that you think might benefit us that might be an upcoming uh, need or budget item uh, that you see as, as a near future, if you do, if anything. Yeah, sure. I mean, that, that's a great question. And I, I think that we are constantly, as you said, technology changes fast. Uh, so we're constantly reviewing and revising our technology plan. Um, and actually, Liz Freitas and I are working uh, closely on a project we've shared with the board, our, our, uh, along with some uh, national organizations who are mentoring us on a project focused on really uh, reviewing and revising our technology plan so that it is looking towards the future. Um, I would say that as we look to uh, integrate the universal design for learning in our classrooms, um, which really focuses on inclusive practices um, and equitable access, I think we're going to want to make uh, sure that our technology matches that so that the, we have the appropriate tools in all of our classrooms to support all of our diverse learners. Um, and tools meaning hardware, but tools also meaning some of those universal applications that can allow students to have uh, accessibility tools embedded right into the Chromebook, right? So that students have the tools they need without needing something extra, um, you know, documented specifically for them. It's just part of what we're offering. We're offering an accessible and equitable experience for all of our kids. So I would say that would be a piece. Um, we would also like to constantly working with our teachers to, to determine what are the appropriate tools for our teachers. Um, and as we look ahead, making sure that our teachers have the tools that are the best tools for them, whether that be a Chromebook or whether that be some other kind of tool, but making sure that our teachers have the appropriate tools so that they can continue to provide uh, excellent instruction in the classroom. But also, if we're in situations where we're providing remote instruction again, they have the optimal tools to provide that remote instruction. 
And Sarah, if I could just add on, not only from the perspective of in the classroom, but the, the behind the scenes work. And uh, I know, you know, Jim, I could see you shaking your head. Yeah. You know, through, through the course of this pandemic, you know, I learned all about threat vectors. I never knew what a threat vector was, but I heard all about them. And, you know, one of the things that we saw with this pandemic is districts and, and municipalities became more and more focused on utilizing uh, computer networks, hackers. Uh, it became very sophisticated at being able to completely lock down districts or completely lock out municipalities or gain access to uh, personal data. So, you know, I think one of the things moving forward that may be a budgetary item down the road is staying one step ahead of these hackers. And, you know, Jim, I know you've talked about it before. On average, how many threats do, does our firewall um, end up intercepting on a daily basis? All right, so here we go. We intercept 5,000 digital hacks a day. Okay. It is, it, it is an amazing number. Um, but, but getting back for a minute about uh, the expansion of our computer network, which is the core of it, uh, we always have to make sure that we are one, uh, one step ahead of the game uh, as we are moving forward also. One of the biggest things, of course, all of our devices generally now in students' hands are wireless. So we have to make sure that the network, the wireless network is always being upgraded and set for the next wireless standards. As we purchase new devices, these devices are coming with the newest wireless standards. So we have to make sure that we're always on top of our game, keeping our network one step ahead of the devices coming in. That is always a budgetary number that is in our budget. Uh, and that is always a consideration. But getting back to cybersecurity, you know, and it is interesting, you know, we hear about Chromebooks and laptops and iPads, um, you know, and uh, student use of them. And we hear about the computer network and what, what is all of that. But in a nutshell, there were so many other subsystems and I touched on this a little bit uh, at our last meeting, but I did wanna talk just a little bit more about it. And these are all the background items that plug into our computer network that help run the district every single day. And this is what the WPSIT team works on every single day. And some of them, I'll give you a short list of them. Of course, the wireless and wired networks, our fiber optic networks that connect all of our buildings together, our firewalls that keep us safe from cybersecurity threats, uh, our VPN connections, that allow people to connect in from home to our network securely. Uh, again, cybersecurity, we're also starting to roll out a cybersecurity training program where we're gonna start to train all of our staff on cybersecurity. Don't click this link. Be careful where you click, watch your email, stuff like that is very important now. Um, at any minute, we, we risk the chance um, of being a part of a ransomware attack. So we're making sure that we always have our eye on the game every minute of every day. We also have uh, a very sophisticated network monitoring system that we monitor the network every day. So, you know, these are just a small segment of all the things in the background that the WPSIT department does every single day. Um, and, and I'm so proud to say they do it so well. Thank you, Jim and Sarah, appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, any other board members? Yes, Ms. Evans. Sorry, I forgot mute. Um, no, I just wanted to say thank you for the um, comments and the presentation. Um, all of them tonight were great. You know, as a, a parent, I saw, I see how much they're using these devices and how they're getting so good at it. But I honestly never, ever thought about what's going on behind the scenes. I mean, everything from picking them up it has been amazing. If we've had a problem, you guys are on it. But I didn't even consider that because I'm old and I can barely turn on my own laptop. But um, I appreciate all that information. And Sarah, I appreciate your vision on kind of where the district needs to go because I think the pandemic kind of shined a light on um, the the importance of technology and how to keep up on it because it's changing so much. So thank you so much for um, you know both the presentations. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other board members? I'll scroll to my other screen. Seeing none. All right. 
Michael, Matt, you have anything else for us tonight? Uh, nothing else this evening from my end, uh, Mr. Carey. Excellent. All right, we'll move on to the phones. Is there anyone on the phone? I don't have anyone in the queue tonight, Mr. Carey. Nope. Any of the, that's all the councilmen. I guess none of them want to talk. Anyone? All right. So board members, we have one more workshop next week. So the hope uh, from talking to Mr. Michaels and I is if there's any more questions, let's get them into Mr. Kazaka or Mr. Emmett so we can have them answered at the workshop. And then we'll come with a number. If you're good with two seven, if you, wherever we're at, and hopefully we can have a consensus at the end of that meeting. And then Mr. Emmett will present his budget to us at the following board meeting. But we have a lot to digest after tonight's excellent presentations and it kind of takes the budget and puts it into perspective of where the money's going and how it's being used to increase student achievement in our district. So I thought it was excellent. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Thank you. A second. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Evans. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, Good night everyone, and be safe. Be warm.